Hi everybody, I'm Skip Alzheimer. Um, I collect old educational films and I am showing them to you. I wasn't quite sure what to show today, um, so I just pulled some Keystone Cop films and I have um, silent films uh, at live shows, but also in these streaming events. And I'm literally showing film, as you can see. Yeah, I can't. Literally, literally showing films. This is a telecine. So, um, yeah. Uh, let's see what else we got. We got at least one more. Um, and I'm, I'm going to see if I can find another silent um, Max Senate to put on for you to, to enjoy. Um, if you like what you see, you can donate to the AV Geeks at uh, Patreon, or you can go to avgeeks.com. There's DVDs for sale there, or you can just tell your friends, share folks. Uh, if you are in the area, 
and of the Research Triangle area. Uh, we'll be doing a screening at uh, Local 506 on Sunday. AV Geeks Sing the Blues, and it's uh, films that document uh, blues makers um, from the 50s, 60s, 70s. Uh, it's a really great show. Um, so that's, I believe it's 8 o'clock at Local 506 in Chapel Hill. All right. So this next film that I'm going to set up. There's another in the series, and this one is Love, Speed, and Thrills. Set it up. Enjoy.
All right, I'm going to run the film backwards, as I rewind. Um, so I found one more film, which is a... Uh, it's more... It's a compilation of a bunch of Max Senate stuff with some goofy narration. Well, not goofy, but it's trying to explain um, the history of Max Senate Studios. Uh, it was a part of a TV show that was uh, in 1959 that aired a bunch of uh, silent public domain films and repackaged them with music and narration and editing uh, for syndication on television. So this was something that people would show. It was kind of a way to add value to stuff that was considered obsolete. Um, at the time. Not unlike uh, colorizing um, black and white film, Ted Turner's a botched attempt to bring back some classic films, show them to modern audiences uh, who eschewed black and white as being old and antiquated. And that didn't go over so well. But it did spawn the National Film Preservation uh, Fund, the National Film Registry, and uh, one of my favorite channels on uh, cable, Turner Classic Movies. Uh, the backlash was so harsh that Ted was like, okay, okay, okay. So uh, there were some good sides to that, I guess. And if the uh, narrator is too annoying, just say in the comments, and I will mute it. Although, I don't know what I would replace with it, it would just be silent then. But, yeah, here we go. Somebody noticed that there was a bunch of leader on the last film. This is from the um, Cultural Resource Library in North Carolina, which uh, put a bunch of leader on the front and the ends of films because they knew that people running the films were not experienced. Um, so they had a lot of leader at the beginning and the end because they knew that that would be the stuff that would get destroyed at first. So that's why it's so long. So here is Fun Factory. Um, fun Factory. Enjoy. of the motion picture. A series in which we follow the growth of a new art. Its earliest beginnings. The first concept of projection. The development of story and spectacle. And the great stars. All a part of the history of the motion picture. The Fun Factory was a place where wonderful raw materials, custard pies, keystone cups, and beautiful bedding girls were assembled onto celluloid, packed into cans, and sent forth to make the world laugh. On the label, one name, Mac Sennett. And in a minute, we'll see how Sennett ran the production line. Max Sennett started as a boy soprano, tried burlesque for a while, then in 1909 he drifted into the Biograph movie studio on 14th Street in New York City. There, everyone did a little bit of everything, and Sennett wrote, directed, and filled in as an actor. Here he is in 1909. 
playing the butler. Shortly afterwards, Sennett started his own studio in California, backed by two gamblers to whom he owed $100. Fatty Arbuckle, Sennett himself in the middle here, and Mabel Normand were the studio's busiest stars. The cornerstone of the Fun Factory was to be the Keystone Cop. The idea began developing in Sennett's mind in 1913 and first emerged on the screen as the Bangville Police. The Bangville Police were a country constabulary. The city uniforms and the police desk were to come the following year but the antics were already unmistakably those of the Keystone Cops. In 1915, the Keystone Cops themselves. The plot? A girl and a boy are trying to elope by boat, taking with them a justice of the peace. Her father, played by Ford Sterling, wants to stop the ceremony. He decides the only way to stop it is to drain the whole lake. Actually, the fact that the Los Angeles Park Department had announced they were going to empty the lake was Senate's reason for shooting the picture in the first place. It was an ingenious way of getting a spectacular effect at low cost. Too busy producing now to play anything but a bit, the Keystone Cop in the next shot is Senate himself. The Senate comedies were rarely subtle. Frat balls, mud, and frantic confusion. Two reels of organized chaos, from which not even the stars were exempt. In 1914, Senate produced Hollywood's first full-length comedy feature, Tilly's Punctured Romance. The star, Marie Dressler, at that time a bigger name than Charlie Chaplin, who played a supporting role along with Mabel Norman. Miss Dressler had come west to reenact the part of the jilted heiress she had so successfully created on the stage. But Sennett was in awe of neither the star nor the original play, and he soon reshaped Tilly into typical slapstick comedy, complete with police desk, falls, and Keystone Cops. Despite her strenuous efforts as Tilly, Miss Dressler did not find a career in silent films. It was to be 15 years before she became one of the greats of talking pictures in Men and Bill and Tugboat Annie. Senate's comics had to be acrobats too. Watch these cops dive in the surf. Senate directed Tilly himself. However, he and Chaplin, whose stature was growing rapidly, began to have conflicting ideas on how to create comedy. And Chaplin soon started directing as well as starring in Senate Two Reelers.
Charlie's costume was already established by now, although his screen character was still forming. This aggressive and inconsiderate little man would soon mellow into the familiar, lovable tramp. Max Wayne, another Keystone great. Aware that Senate underestimated his value, Charles Chaplin was soon to put on his hat and coat and leave the fun factory. In a moment, more of the Mac Senate story. Turning out two or three comedies a week took a lot of ingenuity, and Senate had plenty. For example, to give the impression of wide open spaces for his chase sequences, he devised a revolving cyclorama, a painted background that moved past the actors who worked on treadmills. And of course, the wind machine saw heavy service. Another Senate trademark, and his most attractively packaged product, were the bathing beauties. Beauties such as Phyllis Haver, who started with Senate at $3 a day. This, by the way, was the beginning of the era of the gag titles. Never before had so much girl been exposed to so many people. The costumes were condemned by indignant women's clubs, but moviegoers loved them. Realism was not a Senate requirement, as long as the girls were pretty. In fact, the more improbable the locale, the more the fun. This energetic young lady broke into films when she was only 16 and was soon working with Senate. Though not one of the bathing girls, she was beautiful and versatile. Equally at home, fending off the attentions and jewels of Wallace Beery, or 
flirting with ingenuous Bobby Vernon. It is Miss Gloria Swanson, soon to be Beery's wife off screen, and Cecil B. DeMille's leading star on screen. Carol Lombard started in the beauty department of Senate's Fun Factory 2. But Senate's special protege, his favorite, and the star who worked with him longest was Mabel Norman, a madcap whose life was an incessant whirl, ice cream for breakfast and parties far into the night. Here she is cast as a would-be actress about to undergo her first screen test. A natural comedian, one of Hollywood's finest, Mabel was the Lucille Ball of her day. Put your foot down. Senate produced several full-length features starring Mabel. One of them was The Extra Girl, in Helper, assigned to transform Teddy, the studio dog, into a lion. The real lion has proved too ferocious to play in the key scenes. While Mabel is off getting the dog lion a drink, the crew takes him off to the set. and the lion trainer puts the real lion in his place. Mabel, unaware of the switch, has such trouble getting the water to Teddy that she decides to take Teddy to the water. The background, of course, is the Senate studio itself, with sections of scenery set up for other pictures. Thank <laughs> you. 
many of the great comedy stars, Chaplin, Langdon, Swanson, Arbuckle, Carol Lombard, even Bing Crosby, started in Senate's Fun Factory and went on to spectacular careers on their own. But faithful, cross-eyed Ben Turpin stayed with Mac right through the 20s. Here's a sequence from The Daredevil in 1924. The director is showing Ben how to throttle the villain. He is to burst in and rescue the heroine, played, incidentally, by Madeline Herlock, later the wife of playwright Robert Sherwood. Senate uses Madeline here to make fun of the movie queens who exuded glamour in the most unlikely situations. Ben transfixes the villain with his crossed eyes. He originally crossed his eyes as a bit of business, but somehow they got crossed so permanently that an insurance company wrote a million dollar policy against their uncrossing. In our present editing, we've added sound effects to these scenes, but remember that Senate, with no sound, had to use elaborate pantomime to build up gags like the one coming now so that audiences of the silence felt they'd heard it as well as seen it. neat piece of business, so watch Senate use it again with variations. Now into the inevitable Senate chase with such fun factory trademarks as cars speeded up by slowing down the camera and trolleys backing up by reversing the camera. No action. Make him do something. Humor in slapstick comedy was often built around outrage and sadism. But since it was so divorced from reality and nobody ever got hurt, this grand guignol quality never proved offensive. After sound came in, this brand of humor was to disappear, only to be reincarnated more savage and ferocious than ever in cartoon films. In The Daredevil, Senate is lampooning his own methods of covering actual outside events and exploiting them in his scripts. It's a fire, boss. What a beautiful fire, says the director, and he quickly improvises a script. Where's the stand-in? Back in the tank. Get him!
Senate was always losing his biggest names just as they were proving most useful. When Sound came in 1928, he had no big names left, merely a successful format. But it was a format that was soon to be rendered old-fashioned by the new medium of talkies, in which the sight gag was now almost dead. Senate's activities dwindled, but he left the screen a wonderful, rich heritage of visual humor that has never again been equal. But the loss of his fortune didn't break Mac's spirit. He was to live a long and pleasant retirement, quite satisfied that it also had been his fortune to make the world rich in laughter. Hello. Um, so, yeah, Keystone, Keystone Cops, Max Senate, a uh, variety of different things. Um, so, there you go. There's your uh, silent slapstick for the, the day. Everybody have a good weekend. Um, if you're in Durham, oh, I'm sorry, if you're in Chapel Hill on Sunday, 8 o'clock, uh, AV Geek sings the blues. Otherwise, I will see you uh, on the interwebs somewhere else. Uh, also, I guess if you're in Raleigh, I'm showing Jumanji tonight at the Natural Science Museum, so come out and see that. All right. Uh, again, if you like what you saw, donate to AV Geeks uh, Patreon, or you can just donate. Uh, go to AV Geeks, and we have DVDs for sale and thousands of films online. Um, enjoy them. <laughs>